Welcome to the last service of 2019. How many of you were here last week at our Christmas service? Hands up! And, and I, I don't know about you, but I just found the production last week so, so incredible. And I think it was really, really relevant for the young people, right? And I was following the story so closely. And I was like, oh no, Iceman Z, what's happening? He was at the hospital, he's going to give up his competition. And finally, when he appeared at the last part, right, I legit like happy, you know, that Iceman Z came back. Like, wow, Iceman Z came back. I know it's just a fictional drama production, right? But it's so, so engaging. And I'll show you a big number, all right? Here's a big number. It's 247, okay? Not someone's PSLE score nor someone's waistline. It is the number of people that received Jesus last week in all our Christmas services. Shall we give God a big, big hand? And um, one of the stories came from this service where you do remember our brother Adrian from the IT group. Now, uh, Adrian came to know God not long ago. He, uh, you will remember, um, you might not know his name, Adrian, but you might remember during Hope Conference that we featured him. He is deaf mute, meaning that he, he cannot speak and he cannot hear. So, but yet, the life group, the IT life group, have been really extremely enfolding to help him learn along the way, help him to type messages, to summarize the sermon so that he can learn and grow. And so, Adrian was reaching out to another of his deaf mute friends brought him to the service um, and this friend came and to help him understand the preaching they used this auto translator app that was live translating whatever I was preaching last week and, and the app could show um, the words um, visually and also the live group leader of the group typed out a summary of what uh, the message was about. So this friend was understanding the message and during the altar call, Adrian signed to him what the altar call meant and whether or not he wanted to receive Christ. And when, when the friend agreed, everybody said the sinner's prayer but they signed the sinner's prayer. How incredible is that? God is incredible and God really, really loves people. And, and this is why... This is why we do what we do, my friends. It's not because we want to impress people with uh, like a, a fantastic production or impress people how well we sing or dance, right? We do it so that people can encounter the love of Jesus because people really need Jesus. And I want to encourage us and I want to invite us. Let's pray together. Let's pray for the 247 that did receive Christ and also pray for the many hundreds of others that step into Axis or any of our centres, right, that may not have received Christ yet, that they too will experience and encounter God's love and they'll be drawn one step closer to God. Shall we pray together? Come, really, let's pray together. Church, let's pray. Father, we just commit our 247 new brothers and sisters in the faith. We thank you that they took the step of faith to receive Jesus into their lives. Some of them are here today. Uh, and we just pray, oh God, that the seed that you have sown last week, you'll help it to grow uh, day by day, moment by moment. Help them to grow into the kind of people that you want them to be. Lord, I pray that you will protect their faith, help them um, to overcome the barriers that they may be facing in their growth. And I also pray, oh God, for the hundreds of others that may have stepped into Axis or any of our centres and they may not feel ready to receive Christ yet, that over the next few days, weeks and months, Lord, you will touch them and when they are ready, they will come to a place where they can acknowledge you personally as their Lord and Saviour. So I just pray, oh God, that every single seed that you sow during Christmas, that it will come to fruition. And all this we commit to you and pray in Jesus' name. And the people of God will say, Amen. Amen. You know, I came to faith as a 20-year-old when I was serving my national service. And at a point in time, I was going to enter university. And the background that I came from, I didn't come out, I wasn't a Christian. I didn't come out of a Christian family. I came in, and before I became a Christian, before I received Christ into my life, I was doing very well in school. I went to good schools like Raffles Institution and Victoria Junior College, and I held leadership positions. I was a venture chairman of my uniform group, and I represented my JC in tennis in the A division. So I was doing well in life. And when I received Jesus, I was about to enter university. And I thought to myself that when I enter university, right, uh, when I, and I was about to enter NTU accountancy, and when I enter university, I'm going to kill it. Because previously, even though I did not have God on my side, even though I was a non-Christian then, I was doing very well. Now I've got on my side. Man, I'm unstoppable. I'm going to be invincible, man. Man, I, it's going to be, I'm going to kill it. I'm going to do so well. I'm going to do so well in my studies. I'm going to hold uh, leadership positions and all that, right? So I went into my first semester, of university, very hopeful, very confident, very excited. I went in, I studied very hard, I thought I did well for my papers, and when it came out, you must understand, I'm used to getting a lot of A's or straight A's even. And when I came out, my first semester results, not a single A. I took five modules, not a single A, just a bunch of B's and C's. And I thought to myself, man, I was gunning for first class honours, and in one semester's time, I had to press F to pay respects to my first class honours. It's gone. 
And then after that, I, I like, I was trying to like get involved in church and in CCA and, and in my class, but somehow I wasn't getting along with my friends and everything. And I wasn't fitting in. I was like fitting out. And I was clashing a lot with my church leaders and my church friends. And moreover, during that time, my dad, who had been working in this company and doing very, very well, he was a general manager of this company for more than 10 over years. He was doing very, very well. But suddenly, there was a restructuring, group restructuring going on and this company would no longer exist and they were no longer offering him another position. So he was about to lose his job. And at that point of time also, during all this turmoil, my dad also had a few health scares. He was coming back, back from a, a plane from Australia to Singapore and he fainted. He blacked out on the plane and he fainted. He had blood pressure issues. He had a problem with his eye and he couldn't really see very well. And all these things started to come about and I was like, man, what's going on? I just received Jesus. I thought my life is going to be even better after receiving Jesus. I thought my grades are going to be good. I'm going to do even better with my friends and in church. I wanted to serve and everything and, and my family. And then, why is all these things happening within one very short time period? I didn't understand. And I was upset. I was confused. I was like wondering how come receiving Jesus is so difficult. I didn't have all these problems before I came to faith. Then suddenly after coming to faith, I have all these things. What's going on? So I was expectant. I was excited. I was confident. And then within one semester, it all crashed down on me. And for some of us, maybe we entered 2019, right? And we knew entering 2019 that it was a big year. Because maybe you had some major finals going on, some major examinations. Maybe you're about to graduate in 2019. Maybe you were about to start in a new school, in a new poly, ITE, or university. And it was a big year because you're starting afresh. Maybe for some of you, you finally get back your pink IC, ORD low in 2019. And you know like, oh, 2019, man, my freedom is coming back. Or some of you, you started a new journey where you give up your pink IC and then you get an 11B. Maybe that's 2019 for you. There could be certain expected new beginnings or major things that happened in 2019. But maybe some of us, when we entered 2019, we didn't know what it helped for us. Maybe some of us in 2019, we experienced a severe illness or the passing on of someone very close to us, a family member, a dear friend. And maybe some of us in 2019, we expected or were hopeful to do well, but then we got back some very unexpectedly poor results. And suddenly it's like, where is like my life going? Where does my future lie? I don't even know with these kind of results what I can do. Some of us, maybe we thought that our relationship with our boyfriend or girlfriend was going pretty well and then suddenly out of nowhere, things just took a turn and then the other party just said that they want a new start, a breakup. And you're like, huh? where did all these things come from? Or friends that you were very close to that you thought that, hey, it's going to be just another year. Suddenly, some misunderstanding and you fell out with a very, very good bunch of friends in 2019. And some of these unexpected events that might have happened, right, may have turned our life into turmoil. Well, perhaps your 2019, right, turned out very different from how you expected. Or perhaps you were holding on to certain hopes that there were certain expectations and then there was a mismatch in expectations from what actually happened in reality. How can you then step into 2020 with God? I'm going to show you a message about how you can make sense of what you went through in 2019 and then step into 2020 with hope, with faith, with assurance. But before that, I want to share you a really, really cute meme to start today's sermon, all right? So fix your eyes on the screen. Here we go. And just to be clear, you are the dog and Jesus is the motorcyclist, all right? So you are the dog. Jesus is the motorcyclist. Wait for it. Wait for the light to turn green. The light is green and let's go. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so that's how we're going to drive into 2020 with Jesus, all right? Amen. So yes, now I got your attention. And I'm going to give you a message today, right? To help you, hopefully, to make sense of some of the unexpected events in your life in 2019 and prepare you to step into 2020 with hope, faith and assurance. The title of today's message is, When God's Plans do not match our expectations. When God's plans do not match our expectations. From John chapter 16, verse 16 to 24. And for some of you, the hardest thing you're going to do today, right, is be able to type down this sermon title and find that emoji, right? Because it's kind of, kind of difficult to find it on your phone, right? When God's plans do not match 
our expectations from John chapter 16, verse 16 to 24. And you are new with us, maybe you just received Christ or you just joined us, I want to let you know that one of the things we do in our church is that we take down notes of what we learn during the sermon, what we learn from God's Word so that we can remember it, so that we can take it home and then refresh ourselves and then put it into practice. So if you're new with us, I want to encourage you to just whip out your smartphone, open up a notes app, either Evernote or whichever note app that you use, and just type down this title, When God's Plans Do Not Match Our Expectations, from John chapter 16, verse 16 to 24. Now, watch this. This scene takes place, this scene takes place where the, this, the Jesus was about to be this, betrayed. To, tonight, Jesus was about to be betrayed. It was on the night that Jesus was about to be betrayed. But the disciples did not know this. So they were acting normal. They were having a normal conversation. They were eating and drinking. They did not know what was about to come. And all these things happen, you must know, the disciples had left everything to follow Jesus. He was their rabbi, their teacher, their master, and they had left their families, left their livelihoods, left everything that they had, and they followed him for the last three and a half years. And the last three and a half years, you must know, was amazing. He started to do things like walk on water and he could tell the wind and the waves to come down and they would stop. He could heal the sick and cast out demons. He could raise the dead even. He could do things like, and then when, when people were asking him difficult questions, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they were asking him difficult questions to try to trap him. He would school them and he would own them and he would reply in a way that would confuse them. And, and so the disciples, you must understand, after three and a half years of walking with Jesus, they were really on fire. They were excited. That they were like, this is the man. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. already, you know. We chose the right guy to follow. And now, right, if they are on at the end of 2019, on the cusp of 2020, right, you'll be thinking that, man, 2020 is gonna be awesome. Because Jesus is going to take over. He's going to overthrow the Roman government. He's, we're going to rule and reign together with Him. You know? This is going to be amazing. We're excited. We're, we're looking forward. We can't wait to enter into the next chapter. So this scene was like this. And then it was at this point that Jesus started to have a conversation with them. And this is the setting for our passage today. Jesus said to them in verse 16, In a little while, you will see me no more. Then... After a little while, you will see me. At this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while, you will see me no more. Then after a little while, you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. And Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him, ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while you will see me no longer, then after a little while more you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. And in that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you receive and your joy will be complete. This is the conversation that Jesus was having in his, with the disciples. And the first thing we can learn today is, number one, that we may not always understand God's ways from verses 16 to 20. And you may not understand why this is the point of the sermon, but just write it down first. We may not always understand God's ways. We can learn that from verses 16 to 20. All right? So point number one for today, we may not always understand God's ways from verses 16 to 20. Now you must remember the setting, all right? So the last three and a half years that the disciples had with Jesus, they thought, this guy is the Messiah, he's the Son of God. Then now, you must, you must like, understand that they were really confused because he says, hey, I'm going away for a little while. It's like, huh, where are you going? Are you going to the toilet? Are you going to 7-Eleven? Are you going to buy bubble tea? Where are you going? In a little while, I'll go, then I will come back again. Huh, what are you talking about? I thought we're we going to rule and reign together with you. You're, you're the Messiah, right? 
You are the Son of God, right? You are our Saviour, right? You are supposed to deliver us from all the oppression that we have faced over the hundreds of years, right? You're going away for a little while. For how long? Where are you going? Can you tell us? Why will we weep and mourn and grieve? What are you talking about? And it's like they, they will be thinking, hey, we spent the last three and a half years, right, following this Shifu, right? And he's a, he's a great guy. We know that, why wow, this guy's amazing, right? Huh? He's going to leave us? Did we choose the wrong Shifu? Did we sacrifice our livelihoods and our families and our everything to follow this guy and had an amazing adventure over three and a half years? Then after that, he goes away and leaves us alone. What is happening? You must understand at that point of time, there was probably a lot of confusion. They were probably feeling very emotional. They were probably feeling very perplexed and like, what is going on? Now, you and I, we know the end of the story. We know that Jesus is clearly talking about the resurrection, his death and resurrection. So when he says, in a little while, you will see me no more, he's talking about himself dying. But then after a while, I will come back and you'll see me again. He's talking about his resurrection again. And when he's talking about the grieving and mourning and the pain and the grief, he's, he's talking about when he dies, they, the disciples will be grieving, but the world will be rejoicing. The Pharisees, the Romans, the oppressors, even Satan himself will be rejoicing because it's like they won, they beat Jesus. But then in a little while, when Jesus comes back, then there'll be joy amongst the disciples and nothing can take away their joy. So you and I, we understand because we've seen the movie. We know the story. We know how it ends. But at that very point of time, the disciples didn't know. That's why they were confused. They were emotional. They were, they were like, uh, they wanted to fight back. You remember that conversation that Jesus was having with Peter and Jesus was saying, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and, and I'm going to be arrested all that. And Peter stood up and he rebuked Jesus and he said, no, Jesus, you're never going to do that. You're not going to do that over my dead body. And, and Jesus had to, hey, quiet down, quiet down, you know. And so at, at a point, at that night, even after Jesus explained to them, they were trying to fight back. They were trying to resist. Even on that night when Jesus was arrested and betrayed and the guards came and then they arrested Jesus, Simon Peter, remember, the hot-headed disciple, took out a knife, cut off the guard's ear. And Jesus like, man, didn't I tell you that I need to be betrayed and arrested and all that? Why do you have to cut off his ear? You have to take his ear back, heal the guy's ear, happy new year, you know? And then after that, like, go, go on with the plan, God's plan. And like, they didn't get it. They didn't understand. And they were upset and they were grieving and all that. They didn't understand why Jesus had to die. They didn't understand. And I submit to you that you and I, when we don't understand what we are going through, sometimes it is normal, it is perfectly normal and understandable that we get a bit emotional, that we get a bit confused, that we get a bit lost and perplexed and wondering like, why suddenly... Does my parent fall so ill? Why suddenly did my grandparent who was in the pink of health suddenly pass on without a trace? How come my relationship seemed to be going very well and then out of nowhere, I found out that actually my girlfriend is, or my boyfriend is two-timing me and then asked for a breakup? How come? I thought I was a good student. I was doing well in school. How did I get this kind of grades? And suddenly when this kind of unexpected event surprises us and ambush us. It is normal for you and I to get a little bit emotional. It is normal for us to be upset, confused, lost, and wondering, what's happening? Why is this happening? Why did God, who is loving, good, and sovereign, allow this kind of thing to happen? Oh, well, my friend, you must first understand, the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 to 9, it says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. Neither are your ways my ways. Read verse 9 together with me on the count of three. One, two, go. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts and your thoughts. Here's what God is saying to you and to me and to us today. He says his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. God's ways are higher than our ways. And we must understand this. Because a lot of times, when we look at a situation that we don't understand, it's easy in our own understanding, in our own ways and in our own thoughts to try to like, figure out and we can't figure it out. And when we look at the situation of the disciples there and then, right? 
they can't figure it out because they're so confused. Where are you going? Like, didn't we own everybody in the last three and a half years? You're, you're the son of God. We have no doubt about it. You're the son of the living God. You are our Messiah. Where are you going? Why will we grieve? Why will we mourn? What's happening? And you can understand their confusion, but you and I, because we know the story, we know how it ends, we're like, hey guys, don't worry. Because God's plan will work out for you. You and I, were like, hey guys, chill. Because when you see the risen Christ, right, man, you're going to be overjoyed. You and I, because we know how it ends, we're not so confused as they are. But they are confused because at that point of time, they did not understand. They could not see. They were, they were, all they saw was that it's failure, it's doom, and, and it's grief. Their rabbi, their shifu, was going to be taken away from them. You see, the Bible tells us, right, and the, the writer of Proverbs says this, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, right, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And the writer of Proverbs, uh, in one line, right, contrasted trusting in the Lord with all your heart and leaning on your own understanding. And it, it cannot come together. If you want to trust in the Lord with all your heart, right, you got to give up the right to have complete understanding. And it's important for us to recognize and realize this. A lot of times, right, we, we think to ourselves, right, that I need to understand before I follow God. I need to understand where I'm going, what I'm doing. I need to understand what is God's plan and what is God's purpose before I step in. And if we only think like that, if we only base our actions on what we understand and what we don't, there's a good chance they're going to limit what God can do in your life and limit your understanding of God's ways by your understanding. And we don't want to do that. Don't limit God and what He can do in your life by your own ability to understand. Some of us, we're just not able because of the lack of information to comprehend because we don't know the end of the story. We cannot comprehend how this ends. But don't let that lack of ability to understand limit your trust in God and limit your understanding of God. Because your trust in God right, should not be based on how much have I already understood. Your trust in God should be on His character if you know that He's good, if you know that He's sovereign, if you know that He works all things out for the good of those who love Him, then even when you don't understand, you can step into a situation. You can step into 2020 and say, God, I don't understand at all why I'm in this situation. Yet, I will trust in You. Yet, I will walk into 2020 not with confidence in myself, my own ability, but in confidence in You. And we should trust God based on who He is and not how much we understand. Some of us, we're too smart for our own good. Some of us, we grow up and we think to ourselves that, hey, we're able to comprehend and rationalize and justify and understand everything. And that, while it is your strength, it also becomes your limitation because you are limited by what you're able to understand. And that becomes your barrier. That when you cannot understand something, you're not able to step in you're not able to exercise faith. You're not able to exercise courage because you cannot understand. And if you want to step into 2020 with a confidence and a courage, then you have to be willing at some point to surrender the right to complete understanding. So I step into that semester, my first semester. The grades crash. I was falling out with my friends and the people in church and I was... My, my dad was suddenly, unexpectedly, had a health issue and a job security issue. And I was in a place where I was really lost. And that led me to a point of surrender. Not the kind of surrender that I'm proud of. In fact, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that my form of surrender is really pathetic. It was not the kind of surrender I say, God, I can't do it. I submit everything to you. That's a, kind of like a confident surrender. That's a good kind of surrender. But my kind of surrender was not. My kind of surrender was pathetic. It was like a resignation I was like, oh, I can't do this anymore. God, I'm done. I was thinking of leaving church. I was thinking of leaving the faith. I was thinking maybe I should pull out of school. I don't know where my life is going. I don't know what I'm doing. In one semester, my entire life crashed down. 
am I sure that Christianity is right? Am I sure that there's a God out there? How come I was doing well before any of this God nonsense came into my life and then suddenly after becoming a Christian, all these things happen. If there's a God, obviously He's not working out for me. What's happening? And I was on the verge of pulling the plug on my faith and my life and wondering just where this thing is going. But I was like, okay, God, if you're real and whatever, like, okay, I'm going to trust in you. Like that. Not the kind of surrender that I'm proud of, but just a very resigned kind of surrender. Just like whatever. I don't care anymore. Okay, have my life. Whatever. It's meaningless to me. And I went into my next semester like this. Somehow, I think God didn't judge me or condemn me for my lack of faith, but I picked up my broken pieces. Slowly, slowly, things started to turn in my life. Slowly, slowly, as I continued to work hard in school, I, I, I worked a lot less hard in my second semester than my first because I was like discouraged and I was like, I was despondent and I just didn't want to study anymore. But then I just, I, I continued to study, but not as hard as I did previously. But somehow, out of the four subjects I took, I got three A's. Three out of four A's. Whereas the first semester I studied five subjects, right? I studied everything, not a single A. I just don't know how, but God started to turn the situation around in my school. And then in church and, and with my friends, God, as He humbled me, I was not so arrogant or proud or confident anymore. I was, in fact, very insecure and lacking confidence. But yet, it was a humbling period for me where I just decided that, okay, I'm not going to try to prove myself and how capable I am anymore. I'm just going to serve. I'm just going to try to fit in. I'm just going to try to be a good friend. And slowly, slowly, God helped me build bridges with people. God helped me. I just served as an usher in church. I served as a core team in my life group. And slowly, slowly, God was building my life. As He humbled me, God was building up these pieces of my life. And then also my dad, I mean supernaturally, and this has nothing to do with anything I did, but slowly, my dad, his health got better in that next semester. And also he was offered a job by a company that was worth a lot more in terms of revenue and turnover than the previous company. And they offered him a really, really high po position. So in some sense, right, after that whole saga of him being let go and losing his job, he actually got promoted in that sense to a much better job and our family didn't have to take a financial hit. And all these things happened in a very, very short span of time, right, which leads us and leads me to the second and the final point for today. Number two is that when we recognize God's ways, we will rejoice. That's what Jesus was telling the disciples and that's why I believe God is telling you today that when we recognize God's ways, we will rejoice. We will rejoice. We can learn that from verses 20 to 24. When we recognize God's ways, we will rejoice. From verses 20 to 24. And we are done copying down that point. I'm going to read out these five verses to you as you follow me along on the screen. Very truly, I tell you, this is what Jesus said. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because, of her because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. So here's what Jesus is saying. When the world rejoices, it seems that you're mourning and you're weeping and you're grieving. But once you realize that I have risen, your grieving will turn to joy and no one can take that joy away. When you realize that I am the risen Christ. And then interestingly, right, even though he's talking to a bunch of 12 men, he chose to use the analogy of labor pains, which I don't think they will ever understand. But he started to talk to them and tell them, like, guys, imagine a woman in labor and then, ah, it's so painful and, and he's like, she's in the operating theater or she's like giving birth and it's so painful and she's biting the husband's hand and she's screaming out, you know. And then finally, when the baby is delivered, she's exhausted. The husband has scratch marks and bite marks all over his arm, but yet no one cares anymore because the baby is born and that's all that matters. And they forget the labor pain and they move into... Uh, all they feel is joy. And of course, 
you may not be able to understand this because you're you a really uh, young crowd, right? But I have an analogy that helps help you understand, okay? So imagine with me. Um, let's say, anybody, a uh, menu fan here? Hands up, anybody? Okay, first and foremost, you need to repent for supporting Red Devils. Okay, but okay, we'll work on that and work in progress. Okay, so imagine, like Man U, right, are playing against Arsenal, right? Are playing against Arsenal, it's a big game, and, and it's a really, really big game, and you're watching the match, and then in the 85th minute, you know, Arsenal is 2-0 up, and Man U has been playing poorly, and then, you know, maybe you're gathered in a, in a, in a house watching together with some friends, and then you're like, oh, yeah, this guy sucks, take him out, you know, we should sell him, and the manager, I don't know why we had to hire him, and the chairman has to take responsibility, he buys all the wrong players, and this guy, come on, look at his attitude, takes so long to warm up, this guy, take him off, you should substitute him, he had half time, and you're upset, they're playing so poorly, and, and it's the 85th minute, and nothing seems to be going away. Imagine, right, that someone else, right, who, you know, maybe you're watching it on streaming and then somebody else is watching it live and then they, you know, you're lagged by about seven, eight minutes maybe. And then someone else, right, who knows the score, right, and knows that eventually Man U won 3-2. So if you are the one who knows the score, right, you'll be really excited to watch this scene unpack because these bunch of Man U fans, right, they're upset, they're complaining, they're saying sell everybody, let's sell the club, let's, let's migrate, let's support Spurs now and everything. They're like, I'm done with Man U and whatever, you know. They want to burn their jerseys and everything, right? But you'll be like excited to see, hey, how, how are they going to react? Because you know that eventually Man U won 3 too. So then, as you see the first goal going in, 2-1, you see the Man U fans like, oh, a bit surprised, like, wow, it got chance, ah. but I think, wow, by the way, we are playing, right? Taiko one, la, anyhow one, la, you know? And then, as we get to the 90th minute, bang, equaliser, 2 all. Like, wow, how did that happen? No, wow, they got chance, got chance, wow, you know? Wow, we salvaged a point today. And then finally, in the 91st, 95th minute, boom, the last goal, the, the winner, 3 to wow, with VAR check. Oh yes, wow! You know, and then wow, like you can imagine in the living room, people are jumping and cheering, taking off their shirt, hugging each other, and everything. The scene is wow. And 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 at that point of time, right, you would you would know that actually the first 85 minutes, right, of suffering and of pain, right, they forgot about it already. When you, if you're ever a sports fan, you even though you go through that entire period oh, and you're upset and you're everything and you, you swear that I'll never support this team again or cancel my meal TV subscription or whatever, right? you make all these like, threats, right? In the end, right, when your team wins, right, you're like, wow, whatever, you know, like, woo! And you forget everything. And this is what Jesus is saying here, that you're going through, he's telling the disciples, when you're going through this pain and this grieving and this mourning, hang in there because when, you re- when I return, when I come back for you, you're not going to believe it, man. Boys, your grieving will turn to joy and nothing can take away that joy. And that's what Jesus is saying here. But sometimes a lot of us, right, we sabotage ourselves. And I know fans like this. I know fans, football fans, who when their team is not doing well and not playing well, and, and they just think, oh, it's over. And they turn off the TV and they go and sleep. And it's like, oh, I'm done. And they miss out. The whole, the whole excitement and the thrill, right, of that comeback because they, they turn off the TV prematurely. I know fans who have done that. I know there was one time where Liverpool was 3-0 down in the Champions League finals and I know friends who like were, woke up in the middle of the night, they wanted to watch their team and then at 3-0 down, they turned off the TV and they didn't know and they didn't get to see their team come back from 3-0 down to eventually win the Champions League because they missed out on that moment because they decided to prematurely throw in the towel and a lot of times in Christendom, people do that as well. That before they see the end, before they see what God is about to bring into their life, right, they sabotage themselves by pulling the plug on their faith, by giving up, by throwing the towel, by saying, God, I'm done. I don't think you're real anymore. God, I'm done with this whole church deal. I'm done because like, it's just too hard. And just judging from the events that pan out in my life, you don't seem to be very real. If you're real, you don't seem to care. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why all these things are happening. And you pull the plug on your faith, on your journey with God. And a lot of times we sabotage ourselves. And I want to encourage you as you step out of 2019 and step into 2020, don't sabo yourselves by quitting before God shows you how it ends. Because when you reach the end, your grieving, your mourning, your weeping will turn to joy. But until then, when it's not the end, 
don't make a premature decision. Some of you are thinking to yourself, like you're almost on the verge of throwing the towel, you're almost on the verge of giving up. And I want to let you know that if you throw in the towel now, it doesn't hurt anybody else except yourself. You're going to miss out on whatever God is about to do in your life. God's going to give you free will. God's going to allow you to follow through on the decision that you're about to make. But the person that you're sabotaging is really yourself. And sometimes it's normal to get emotional. It's normal that when a lot of things happen that we don't understand, that we're confused, we're lost, sometimes we're upset, we're angry, we're depressed. I get it. And it's fine. It's normal. And, and if you didn't have all these emotions, it's not normal. It's perfectly okay. But when you are in that emotional state, can I encourage you? Don't make any big decisions that will change the course of your life. When you are in an emotional, highly emotional state, don't do anything or say anything that don't follow through on any action, right? That can really sabotage your life, that can have long-term consequences of your life. And I learned this from Pastor Shirley. She taught us that when you are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, you need to halt. Don't do anything. Just, 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 just stay in that moment. Just do something else. Because when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, you're going to make all the worst decisions. You're going to make all the wrong choices. And she shared about how one time she was preaching a sermon, uh, preaching at uh, evangelistic service, and no one came to no one came to faith. No one came forward. No one responded to God. She went home and she just cried her tears out and she typed out her resignation letter and she said, I'm going to give this in on Monday and she ate one whole tub of ice cream. But in the end, she didn't. And you must understand that sometimes when discouraging things happen in our life, we have a tendency to overreact. We have a tendency to respond in a way that it just sabotages ourselves I want to let you know that if you quit now, if you give up on yourself, on life, on God, on your faith, on your family, on friends, at this point of time, you cannot see. But if you hang in there, if you just hang in there, and I'm not even talking about like more very, very powerful kind of stuff. I'm just talking about just hanging in there and say, okay, God, I don't know what is coming, but I'll just follow you and whatever you just show me, what your plan is, just hang in there. And don't do anything that will sabotage you, sabotage yourself. Today we have a story of uh, a friend from NUS called Carmen. She's about to share with us that when she entered 2019, she was very resolute to change and fight certain things in her life. Hi, Carmen. And, uh, and I'm going to let, let her tell you the story, all right? So please put your hands together and welcome Carmen. Um, hi, I'm Carmen, a year four student studying psychology and social work in NUS. Uh, uh, <laughs> I've been suffering from eating disorder, depression, and compulsive exercise since 2014. Basically, this condition means that I have extreme concerns about eating, such as uh, nutrition breakdown in quantities, and exercising, to the extent that it causes me distress and negative impact on other areas of my life. I set many clean eating and fitness goals which I depended on for my sense of worth, achievement, and pleasure. It was like an addiction. I spent most of my time and energy planning and executing my food and exercise routine to the point where I was too drained to focus on anything else. I lost interest in studies, relationships, and to some extent, God as well. I also had severe conflicts with my parents over my eating and exercise patterns. Pursuing those ideals gave me momentary pride and satisfaction, but it also made me constantly anxious, feeling like I had to do more to maintain my diet and fitness achievements. Perhaps you might find it difficult to believe that activities that seem healthy for everyone can become so unhealthy for someone. God had spoken to me countless times that holding on to my ideals would hinder me from finding true joy and freedom in Him. When 2019 began, I made a commitment to surrender my goals and ambitions to God. Though initially motivated, I soon struggled to follow through. I experienced withdrawal symptoms like urges to exercise and voices of self-blame for breaking my food and exercise rules. As I struggled, I felt that God didn't understand how miserable and difficult this was for me. I began to go back to my old way of life, 
seeking pleasure from exercise again. I knew it wasn't helping me, but I did not want to care anymore. At least the exercise was giving me temporary relief from the pain of life. I got more and more extreme with my exercise and eating routines until my weight crashed severely and affected my mental capacity and mood. My studies also crashed because I was too busy attending all of my fitness training sessions. I didn't have the heart to study and I felt very low and fidgety all the time. My relationship with my parents even worsened and resulting in me staying out for long periods of time to avoid my parents. But God didn't just leave me in the lurch. He spoke to me on multiple unexpected occasions, including the times that I was trying to shut his voice out. So once, I, will, I just finished gym and two Christians came up to share the gospel with me. They asked me if I was sure of my salvation and I couldn't answer them because I thought I had buried myself too deep in shame and darkness for God to redeem me anymore. Seeing that I couldn't answer, they offered to pray for me. Another time, I was at a fitness class when the fitness instructor told me, I know what you're going through. It's difficult, but I'm praying for you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. During this messy period, God also sent many other brothers and sisters to speak truth into my life and to pray for me. I remember having many breakdowns through which my mentor, leaders and life group leaders, uh, life group mates would sit with me. My mentor would also spend countless hours helping me clarify my thoughts and what God says about each of these thoughts. So there was this time that I quarreled with my parents. I went running with two church friends who I had grown closer to due to our common interest in running. Not only did they counsel me to submit to my parents, they also expressed their willingness to support me in recovery by changing our runs to nature walks. There are many, many more people who showed God's love to me and you know who you are, thank you. At my lowest in June this year, God assured me that he had not left me even though I had failed so many times to obey and ran away from him. He reminded me of Romans 8, that nothing in this world would separate me from his love. Then, then, I knew that no matter how alone I feel, or felt, or will feel in my battles, he is with me. No matter how far I felt I've fallen, nothing can separate me from his love. And as I began to open my hardened heart to God again, he reminded me that my life belongs to him. As much as I wanted to rule it on my own, I couldn't run away from the fact that he is the only one who knows my purpose. He is my creator and my father who cares deeply about me, including my physical health. His plans are not meant to harm me, but to prosper me and to give me a future and hope. It was then that I was fully able to face the truth, that my goals and ambitions were self-destructive. It was also then that I came to terms with the pain involved in surrendering this part of my life to God. Even though the pain will be great, it cannot compare to the joy, purpose, and freedom of living in His truth. And I am not alone in facing this pain because His Holy Spirit is with me, giving me the love, power, and self-discipline to stay on the path of recovery. After conference, I shared with my leaders what God had spoken to me, and I decided to seek treatment again. And really, really, thank God, the hospital offered this new program for compulsive exercise under the existing eating disorder program. So through these services, I received the medication and therapy that I needed. When I look back at all that had happened in 2019, I'm filled with thanksgiving. I started the year with a great resolve to fight my disorder, only to spiral lower and lower into my bottomless pit. Yet in this seemingly terrible year, I encountered the love, patience, and grace of God in a measure that I have never experienced before. And though I'm still on the road of recovery, I'm assured that even in my pain, God has a plan and purpose for my life. And as 2020 comes, I'm going into it only asking that he gives me enough grace to continue walking with him. Thank you. Can we give Karma a big hand? Thank you. Thank you for so courageously sharing such a personal struggle and you know, how 2019 was for you. And maybe 2020, you're looking forward to it and you're thinking, oh, it's going to be an exciting year because there's something exciting looking forward to in your life. Maybe ORD, you're going to start university, maybe you're finally going to graduate and then go out to work. Maybe some of us in this room, you're in a situation where 2019 was rough. 2019 was difficult. 
2019 might have been a year where there were some unexpected challenges in your life that were so tough and you are a bit dreading entering 2020 thinking to yourself, man, how long more can I bear this? I don't think I can take another year of this. I don't know about you and what your situation is, but I want to let you know that whether you're in a good place or in a not so good place, that you can end 2019 and begin 2020 by trusting in God's ways, by knowing that God is with you and leaning not on your own understanding, but saying, God, I may or may not understand your ways, your plans for me, but I will trust you, I will walk with you, and I will end 2019 and begin 2020 trusting that your thoughts are higher than my thoughts, your ways are higher than my ways. I acknowledge it today, and I'm surrendering my understanding or lack thereof to you and saying, I understand or I don't understand, I will trust in you. For the final time in 2019, shall we put away our things, rise to our feet and prepare to respond to God?